Bible and you can open it to the book of Psalm, chapter 32. That's where we're going to start. I'll kind of be there shortly, Psalm chapter 32. Uh, <clears throat> those of you that are disappointed you thought Demac was going to be here this morning, uh, you showed up and he's not here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, just so you know, I was inspired by all of that. I've never been much of a rapper, but I was inspired and I, I thought about rapping my sermon this morning, but I, I couldn't quite get it all to come together. So the thing, the thing, yeah, it's because, uh, I'm not a rapper. I'm a hand clapper, a toe tapper, a finger snapper, a devil zapper, and I love God's word. Amen. <laughs> Who said white preachers can't rap? All right. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's all right. I can't jump either. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Psalm chapter 32. If you look in, uh, oh, starting at about verse 5, this is a psalm that, that David wrote. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. Didn't try to cover up my sin. I just exposed it before you, O oh God. He said, I, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. If you're thankful that God forgave your sin this morning, would you just give a shout of amen this morning? Amen. So therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with the shouts of deliverance. God is expressing his, or I mean, David is expressing his thanksgiving to God, what God means to him. You're, you're hiding place. I can trust you. Anybody who puts their faith in you and prays, God, you will hear. So he's honoring God and he's worshiping God. And this is God's response in, chap, in verse number eight. God's response is this. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near to you. Be not like a horse or a mule. And the title of my message this morning is this, Mule in Sheep's Clothing, all right? Look at, check out the, uh, eh, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. So, so just a little side note here, uh, you know, I always shoot the, my title to Jennifer the day before and she can work up a, a title slide and I said, I'm going to see just how good you are. And uh, so I gave her the title. And I thought, she'll never find anything on the internet, uh, you know, a mule mixed with a sheep. And she didn't. So her and Matt made this. So I thought that was pretty brilliant. So, <laughs> mule in sheep's clothing. So before I get started, I got a mule joke for you, okay? So let's, let's see if you guys. Uh, what did the mule do when he got cut off in traffic? He honked. <laughs> right? Yeah. Thank you. It's good. I'm not a rapper, but I am a joke teller. A man, a man in the movie theater notices what looks like a mule sitting next to him. Are you a mule? Asked the surprised man. Yes, said the mule. What are you doing at the movies? To which the mule replied, well, I like to the book. You have to get that one later. That's all. That's, that's all. I'll stop there. That's all my mule jokes. I just thought you'd get a kick out of it. So, uh, so in this, uh, so in this psalm, uh, in this psalm, you know, David expressing his love to God. God is pleading with David. Ultimately, the whole purpose of what David, God is saying here: don't be like a horse or a mule without understanding that has that it must be curbed or turned with a bit and a bridle, or it won't, won't stay near to you. And so God is basically using; he's pleading, pleading with David ultimately to just learn how to follow God's lead willingly rather than having to be forced, right? So he's, God's using the stubborn nature of a mule to get this point across uh, to David. And you know how, how it is. I mean, a mule is not going to just willingly follow. You have to manhandle it as opposed to a sheep. And we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the scripture uses a mule and a sheep, their, their nature, the, the, the nature of a mule is completely different than the nature of a sheep. How many of you know that? And so the, the scripture compels us to be like sheep who will follow their shepherd willingly. Amen? Because they know that the shepherd will feed them. They know the shepherd will protect them. And sheep are defenseless. And they, they, there's something in the nature of a sheep. It knows it's defenseless. And it recognizes its need for a shepherd. So it's willing to just follow the shepherd as opposed to a mule that has its own way of doing things. A mule that has a tendency. There's a reason why the phrase was coined stubborn as a mule. Right? So we as Christians are supposed to be uh, meek as a lamb. But many times we find ourselves being stubborn as a mule. 
Uh, now, I want to Papa was telling me a story here a while back. It's been several years ago, but I happen to remember it uh, as I was studying for this message. Uh, when he was younger, was it you and your brothers? Yeah. It, when Papa was younger, him and his brothers uh, had a mule and had it hitched up to a trailer and had taken it down to the spring, and they were hauling water back uh, in, in big barrels on this cart. So the mule uh, just decides that it, it was done. It didn't want to work anymore, and it just, it just stopped, and it just sat down. He said they, they pulled, they prodded, they poked, they grabbed its tail and tried to stand it up. They kicked it. They took sticks and beat it. And it just sat there. In fact, it just kind of laid down. It just decided it wasn't going to go anywhere. So it didn't. No matter how hard they prodded and pulled, it decided I'm, it, I'm not going any further. So he said they, they thought, well, we'll teach this mule. And so they took a bunch of brown leaves and they piled them up underneath this, this mule and set the leaves on fire. And so as the, the, the fire gets building up and the leaves begin to burn, uh, literally, he said, that mule sat there and the hide was burning the mule. It's, it just sat there and took it until it absolutely couldn't take it anymore and then finally stood up, but literally had to burn the hide off of this thing in order to, to get it to do anything. And I wonder, and I know that this probably doesn't, you guys probably don't resemble this at all, but uh, uh, I wonder how much... God has to prod us that way. You know, you've heard the saying, you know, she, uh, wolf in sheep's clothing, obviously, and most of us, you know, probably don't fit too much into that category. When we think about a wolf in sheep's clothing, we think about somebody who's deceptive, uh, somebody who's trying to deceive or fool somebody or mislead somebody intentionally. And so we, you know, we're God's sheep, and we maybe don't identify with that wolf in sheep's clothing too much, but I, I think probably if we'd be honest with each other, there's a little bit of mule in all of us, Amen. That we have uh, sometimes the, the spirit of God that is constantly trying to get us to move and trying to get us to do what he wants us to do, only to have us many times just sit down on our holy hind ends at times, amen? And, and sometimes, how many of you ever had God light your, your tail on fire? Amen? I've been there. So that's ultimately what God is saying to David. David, learn to live in such a way that I can speak to you and you'll just do what I've asked you to do, that you'll just follow, that you don't have to be like a mule, that I have to just wrestle you around to get you to do whatever I need you to do. In Jeremiah, the second chapter, um, God uses a mule as an example once again in describing the children of Israel, and this is in the 23rd verse. God says to them, how can you say I'm, I'm not unclean? In other words, Israel's opinion of Israel, of themselves, was pretty good. I mean, when Israel looked at themselves and described themselves, they described themselves as, well, we're God's people, right? We follow God's law. We do God's will. We're, we're naturally good people. And God said, how can you say that when I see, when I look at you, I see a stubborn people that rebel at everything that I say. I see a people who, I mean, you know, these people were bragging that they knew the commandments and they had Moses' law. God said, I'm not looking for people who brag that they know my commandments. I'm looking for people who will obey my commandments, right? And so he says, how, how can you say I am unclean and have not gone after the Baals or the false gods? He said, look at your way in the valley. Know what you've done. A restless camel running here and there. And look at this. A wild donkey used to the wilderness in her heat sniffeth the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need weary themselves. In her month, they will find her. So what does that mean? Ultimately, this is what it means. He's comparing the nation of Israel, God's people, okay, to a donkey or a mule that's in heat. And when a mule, he says, who's in heat and catches the scent of another mule in the wilderness, Catch, it's amazing to me how, how that works with animals, that they can be, you know, almost miles apart, but God designed them in such a way that they, you know, they, they put off a scent, and when they're in heat, they, they can find each other, male. And, and so he said, a, a mule that catches the scent uh, of another mule in the wilderness that's in heat, he said, no matter what you do to try to stop it, you won't be able to stop that mule. It is going to go into the wilderness. It's going to find its mate and do his thing. No matter how much you try to stop it, it's, you, you can't stop it. It is a picture of the human nature. Amen? The human nature that is constantly lusting for that that it shouldn't have. And, and, and believe me, as a, as a pastor, I've said across the, the desk for many people, and it, it's obvious, you can, I can tell sometimes 10 minutes into a conversation if a person will listen to God's reason or not. 
And there's times in my own life where I, I knew I heard the voice of the Spirit of God pulling me back. Try, don't do this. Don't say this. Don't go there. Trying to get me. But I, the, the human nature and the lust of the flesh that pulls He said, we can become like a mule that is just so stubborn it's going to have its way. We need a nature change. We don't want to just look like sheep. We don't want to just look like Christians. We we don't want to, we can't be a, 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 a sheep, I mean a mule in sheep's clothing, having the appearance of a sheep, but having the nature and the character of a mule, right? God said, I want my people to be that in such a way that they know who their shepherd is, they know their shepherd's voice, and will faithfully follow them. Um, when you look at, of course, I could spend an hour just talking about Israel, obviously. And the Bible teaches us that all of these things happen to them, the nation of Israel, as an example. An example for who? Us. We read the Old Testament and we see Israel and, and you know, how the times that they disobeyed God, and we see what happened in their history, and it, we can apply that as an example to our own life. So one of the ways Israel was stubborn all the way, and again, he's like, you guys are like a mule that I can't, I can't hold back. One of the ways that they were stubborn was the fact that Israel at one point insisted on having a king. You have to understand how Israel was run. When God first started the nation of Israel with Abraham, and then it grew and it built and they multiplied, God was king. Okay, God is the one that made all of the decisions. He's got Moses as the leader, but who did Moses go to for direction? God. This is how God designed it. You've got God's called a theocracy, not a democracy. God said, I, God said, my church, my, I've never uh, set up as a democracy. Now, ultimately, what God is saying is this, I don't want your opinion, right? So God set up a theocracy in which he's in charge, and then he would speak to Moses, who would speak to the people, and so on and so forth. So during this time, the nation of Israel prospered. I mean, dur- under, under God's reign and under God's rule, when they were literally listening to what God said, their nation prospered and things were good. But the nation of Israel got to looking around at all the other nations who had kings. And they thought, we, we don't want to be different than everybody else. We want to be like all the other nations. And so they go to Samuel, who was the prophet at that time, and they said, we want you to appoint a king over us so that we could be like every other nation. Okay? God, remember, God says, I just want you to follow me. No, 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 no. They're, they got that mule mentality. And so God pleads with them. And God said, look, okay, look, here's what's going to happen if you have a king. He's going to take, he's going to tax you and take part of your crops. He's going to take your sons and he's going to bring them into his army. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to bring them into his harem and all those types of things. He said, or harem. He's going to, a king will will rule you and you'll lose under a king. So he's trying to get them, just follow me. But they absolutely refused to just simply follow God. So they pulled and they bucked against the reins that God had on them. No, we want to go our own way. We want our own, we want to be our own people. And so God says, all right. And you know what he did? He did one of the, one of the, one of the harshest punishments that God can give us is to give us what we want. You realize that? Sometimes that's a, that's the meanest thing God can do is just give us what we want. And so God did. All right. You bunch of stubborn mules, you don't want to be my sheep and follow me, I'll give you what you want. He gave him a king. And you'll never guess what that king did. He taxed them and he took their crops. He took their sons into his arm. Everything that God warned them would happen, happened. You know, we, we look at that and it doesn't make any sense that we think, but how, I mean, how many times in our own life God is pleading with us, his spirit speaking into the innermost part of our ears, trying to lead us. All God wants to do is lead us. He's the good shepherd, amen? He's comp- Even today, as God's people, we as the church, we shouldn't want to be like every other, everything, everybody else in the world. I mean, doesn't the word of God compel us to come out from among the world and be separate, to be a peculiar people, to be different than the rest of the world? There, there shouldn't be anything in us that wants to be like everybody else in the world. There shouldn't be anything in us that wants to be like every other church in the world. God said, I'm looking for a church of people who will just seek my face and be sensitive to my voice and follow me rather than have their own way. And it's not any different now, and I'm sure that you can testify to this in your own life. Anytime I have 
you know, pulled against the reins and God gave me what I wanted, I was never happy about that later. Amen? It never works out. God just simply knows and he's looking for people who will follow close. The sheep that survives the longest is the sheep that, that follows the closest. Amen? A trust any shepherd. But no, Israel had to have a king. Rather have a king, they'd rather have a king to drive them than a God to lead them. And so when you get to reading through, and I'm not going to read all through this, but um, in Samuel, you can read about this in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, back in chapter 13, we see where them having a king, Saul, King Saul, he was the very first king that God chose for them. And, and Saul went from bad to worse. I mean, the guy just, he just botched the job of being king. And because uh, Saul was stubborn, God would compel him and want him to lead, and, and it, Saul always ends up doing his own thing. And here's an example, and this is in 1 Samuel 13, uh, verse 11. Uh, Samuel said, what have you done? Well, first of all, let me tell you what happened. Uh, in the nutshell of what happens here is that um, in this day, under the law, there was only, not everybody could just offer a sacrifice unto God, okay? It was only the priesthood, those who were priests, the prophets were the ones who were able to offer, offer the sacrifice, which is a lot different, obviously, than today. You and I have, an, have a straight access to God. Every one of us can go and pray straight to God. We can offer sacrifices of praise, but in that day under the old law, they had to go through a man. They had to go through the priest, and so not everybody could just offer sacrifices. There was a certain way that had to be done. Well, Saul decides, you know what? Anybody can offer a sacrifice. I'm the king. There was a sacrifice that needed to be offered. Now, in his defense, he was, you know, about to go into a major decision, wanted God's will. But rather than waiting on God, waiting on Samuel, the man of God, to come along and offer the sacrifice, Saul just pulls against the rain and decides, I'm just going to go ahead and do it my way. And so he offers the sacrifice, which he's not supposed to do. So then we pick up here in verse 11. Uh, Samuel, the prophet, said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and, have not sought the, and, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself. Kind of mule-like, isn't it? That's the difference in a mule and a sheep. A sheep just follows. A mule forces what? Himself and his own will and his own desire. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. If you had learned to just follow my way, I would have established your kingdom forever. But, everybody say but. But, but since you didn't, now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over the people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Samuel rose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul, so on and so forth. So basically what God's saying is this. You're a mule, and I can't do anything with you, so I'm going to find a sheep. I'm going to find a man. Israel has decided they've got to have a king, so I'm at least going to find a man that will follow me. And so he rejects Saul, and guess who he goes after? A man by the name of David, who wrote this psalm we started off with, and says, God says to David, David, don't be like Saul. Don't be like a mule that I've constantly got to be fighting you to get you to do what I, what I want you to do. Just learn to be a shepherd. What, what better person to be king than someone who had been a shepherd? Amen? That's what David did. That was his career. He was a shepherd. He knew what it was to take a, a, a flock of sheep into his care. He knew what it was to fight with wolves and lions uh, in order to protect his flock. He knew what it was to stay, to, to stay awake countless hours, all night long, denying himself comfort and rest so that his sheep would be protected. God said, if I'm going to have somebody to follow me as a sheep, then I'm going to get a shepherd to do it. You may, have, you may have read a certain psalm or heard it over the years. It goes something like this. The Lord is my shepherd. You ever heard it? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Did you get that? He leads me beside the still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David is saying, I've learned that I have no need to fear because God is my shepherd. As long as I learn to follow him, he will lead me in the path of righteousness. What does that mean? Ultimately, God will lead me into a walk where I can do the right thing. Amen? I know that we're fighting a sin nature, and I know that at times it's difficult to do the right thing, but don't let us ever succumb to the lie that we can't do the right thing. Don't let us ever listen to the lie of the devil that we're not able to overcome temptation. Yes, we are. We can be a a holy people. God said, I want you to be holy as I am holy. Holiness is not in the clothing that we wear and in the things that we do. I mean, he said, I'm looking for people who will just long for holiness and righteousness that want to do the right thing. But we can't do that when we buck against God in his way. David said, you're leading me into the path of righteousness. I'm going to follow you. You're leading me beside the still waters, the, the quiet, calm waters in which my soul can be restored and my soul can be refreshed. You know why many times we agonize? You know why many times our life is just, just miserable and, and tormenting a lot of times? is because we're not following God by the still waters. We're looking, we're looking for the, the, the well of pleasure in life and what we want, and it does nothing but leave us frustrated. But David said, Lord, you'll lead me behind this, by the still waters where I can find rest for my soul, where I can benefit, and you will meet every need that I have. Sheep aren't, they're not a worrisome type animal, as long as the shepherd is close, amen? As long as the shepherd is close. Jesus uses this, if you look into John, the, the 10th chapter, Jesus uses this sheep analogy, saying, he said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd will lay his life down for the sheep if necessary. And Jesus, willing to lay his life down on the cross of Calvary so that you and I could, could know salvation, so that you and I could escape hell and have eternity in peace with God, what does he look for? Doesn't he look for people who will just, on, just follow him? Jesus said, I'm, I'm the shepherd. And he said, the sheep, my sheep, know my voice. My sheep Know my voice. Folks, we can, never, we can never faithfully follow God if we don't know his voice. You say, well, how, how can I know the voice of God? Because let's be honest, we all hear voices, amen? I mean, not like in a creepy, schizophrenic type of way. I just mean that we, we hear voices. There's, we, there's the voice of our own flesh. There's the voice of the enemy that's constantly lying to us. There's the voice of the world and this pop psychology and this, uh, you know, the world view. Those voices are so loud and it, we're always, sometimes we find, which way do I go? What do I believe? And God said, if you'll listen, if you get into the quietness of my spirit, you'll find that I'm speaking to you through my word. I'm speaking to you and you can hear my voice if you're willing to hear it. You know why many times, honestly, Many times, most of the time, probably, no, all the time, we don't hear the voice of God is because we're not listening for it. We're, we're acting kind of mule-like, amen? But God said, if, you're, if, you, if you submit yourself to the status of a sheep like David did, David was a king, but he said, I'm gonna humble myself and submit to God as my shepherd because I know he's got my best interest in, at heart. You look at, you contrast that between someone like um, I don't know, like, like, someone like the rich young ruler, for example, who comes to Jesus and he said, what do I need to do to have eternal life? There was this religious notation about the guy. What do I got to do? Hey, Jesus, hey, I want to be friends with you. What do I got to do to make, make heaven my home? And, and Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not murder. That's, you know, and he names off the commandments. And the guy says, oh, oh good. Well, good. I've, I've kept those commandments all my life. And he, he wanted this appearance that he was a sheep. On the sheep, on the outside, he was a sheep. But then Jesus exposed the muleness inside of him. Jesus exposed that he was actually a mule in sheep's clothing when Jesus said, okay then, I want you to sell all that you've got, leave everything behind, come and do what? <laughs> come and follow me, be my sheep, follow me. I mean, we read about the 12 disciples, this dude could have been the 13th. Amen? Honestly. I want you to come and follow me and be my sheep. You know what the guy did? He pulled against the reins. Pulled against, no, I, I'm, I won't do that. His heart was in his possessions. 
His love was in his money. Jesus knew that. Jesus, everybody else saw a sheep. Jesus saw the mule. Man, it's a, it's a, it's a wake-up call to me. I think for me, it's a, it's a good time for soul searching to look, okay, God, I, first of all, I don't have to search very far. I can see some muleness in me, amen? And probably five minutes, a five-minute interview with my wife, she could tell you there's a little mule in me, amen? <laughs> it probably wouldn't take five minutes, actually, in truth be known. Um, but we're, look, we're looking, looking, God's looking for that, that person. Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. I, my voice will be present if, you're, if you'll be listening. And we, we look at like the disciples. For, you know, when Jesus needed a people, he needed a group of people that he could pass the torch on to, okay? Jesus was only gonna be on this earth for a relatively short period of time. Jesus was around 33 years old when he was crucified, Okay? He was about 30 years old when he began his, his ministry, his earthly ministry. So basically, you know, nobody in the world knew who Jesus was up until he was 30 years old. He was crucified when he was about 33. So literally, there was like a three-year window. I mean, you guys know how fast three years goes by, the older you get. And so Jesus, who is the light of the world, who comes onto the earth scene and begins to explain to people what the heart of God is really all about. And then, and, and he begins to teach, and he begins to heal and he begins to save, he begins to forgive, he begins to represent who God really is, the love, the loving nature of our, of our father, the shepherd who loves the sheep. And that's what Jesus wanted to present. And so he needed a people that would follow him and listen to his teaching, a people that once Jesus was crucified, he could then pass on the torch that they would carry the gospel to the world. And so Jesus, ultimately, when he's calling disciples, he's just looking for people who are willing to drop, all, to drop everything and follow him. You say, well, that's too much to ask. Well, that's what he's looking for, amen? For a lot of people, it was too much to ask. But Jesus walks up to, you take someone like, well, Peter, uh, who was a fisherman, and, and, and well, let's look at James and John specifically. James and John were brothers, and they were fishing, they were fishermen, and they had a business. They had a fishing business with their dad, Zebedee. And so they're out there on the, on the sea fishing with the nets like they did every other day of their life. And here comes Jesus. This, this one particular day is completely different. This one day in which their entire life is on a, on a what do they call it, a fulcrum? This, their entire life is on a pivot. It's level. It's like what they decide to do when, with Jesus' invitation, determines the whole direction of the rest of their life. It all come down to how they responded to one phrase from Jesus. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. These guys are out there. They're wrestling their nets. They're bringing in the fish. And here Jesus comes, and they hear the compelling. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. It's staggering. It's staggering. You know what they did? They dropped everything. They dropped their nets. They left their boat. They left their father. Dad, we're leaving the business. We're going into the ministry. <laughs> and they just followed Jesus like sheep. And Jesus led those men, taught those men, and those men went on to carry the kingdom of God to the world. Do you know why you and I are saved today? Because those men left their nets then. Think about that. How, how connected we are. Had those guys pulled against the rain. Let's say that Jesus couldn't find anybody to follow him and everybody pulled against the rain like a mule. No, I want life my way. We wouldn't have the gospel today. How many people in the future, let's say that Jesus, I mean, Jesus could come at any time, but let's say Jesus don't come for another thousand years. I doubt it'll be that long honestly, but let's say Jesus don't come from a th for a thousand years. How many people, how many of our descendants in the world a thousand years in the future, how many of them are relying on us to faithfully follow Jesus, to take up our cross, lay down everything, and just follow the Lord? How many are counting on us? All of them are, amen? The continuance of the gospel all depends on the people who are willing to be sheep-like. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And so they did. Elisha kind of did that. I always, liked, I always kind of liked the, you know, uh, Elisha when he was called by God. When, 
Let's see. There's Elijah and there's Elisha. For, so you have to keep up here. Elijah was the prophet of God for a good long while. And it come to the point where Elijah's ministry was about to end. And God said, I want you to go over and I want you to talk to this man by the name of Elisha. I've got a work for him to do. And Elijah comes by and he casts his mantle as to call Elisha and say, basically, God's got a work for you to do. You know what Elijah was doing? No, Elisha was doing? Elisha was out in the field with the plow. He's got a team of oxen and, 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 a, and a plow, and he's plowing the ground, he's working, because God always called working people. And he's working, and so here comes, and just in a, in a split moment, and no doubt, there's no doubt God had already kind of been dealing with them. Maybe these guys who were fishing thought, man, there's got to be more to life than this. We, we catch fish, we scale fish, we eat fish, we catch more fish, we scale fish, we eat fish, we sell fish. There's got to be more to life than this. And so Jesus comes along and says, there is. And if you'll follow me, I'll show you something deeper. I'll show you God on a deeper level. One reason why sometimes God seems so distant, distant to us is because we're holding to ourselves. God will always reveal himself in a greater way to those who will leave everything for him. And Elijah, Elisha, as he he's, you know, uh, comes and he's called to a greater work. And the Bible says that he takes this plow, he breaks it all up into pieces, he, he, he gets a little bit of lighter fluid, I don't know, he sets it on fire, he kills the oxen, slices them all up, cooks them on the fire, has a big party, and tells his family, hasta la vista. And he leaves, I mean, he leaves and he goes out into the ministry and Elisha was a great man of God. When you read about how faithful he was that God could speak to him and he would just do. I mean, it's not complicated really, is it? We make it complicated, but I know that God looks over the brink of heaven, he's got to, and say, I just wish I could find some people where I would speak and they would just do, amen? Without fighting, David, don't be like a mule that I've constantly gotta be fighting you. Just do what I'm asking you to do. Elisha, it was his way of saying, basically, I'm never going back. He didn't keep the oxen and the plow in the barn, just in case this whole God thing, ministry thing don't work out. He, he got rid of everything that would hold him back. He was fully committed to being a sheep and following God wherever he would lead. Now, let me ask you a couple questions here. You can kind of determine if you have more of a sheep nature or a mule nature. And maybe already within this sermon, you may already know. But let me ask you this. Did God have to wrangle you into church this morning or did you will, willingly follow him here? When it comes to, to Sunday morning, and, I, and, you know, and I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the people who were here all the time preaching to the choir, and you want to be here for a reason. My purpose in this message isn't to call you all a bunch of mules, by the way. To folk, make you focus on your disobedience. I want you to see that there's more sheep-like quality in you than you think there is. You're here this morning because you desire to be here. God, my guess is God didn't have to guilt any of you to come to the house of God this morning. You got up today because you knew it was important. Because you knew that you know how much you need God in your life. And so you all like sheep followed Jesus into this place today. That's commendable. Amen? If we find ourselves fighting against God just to do something as simple as being in his house, then we might want to take a good, deep look at our heart. Amen? Did, did God lay someone or something on your heart uh, to minister to this week? Something, maybe somebody come to your mind. God, there was really this pressing feeling that you needed to minister to this person or you needed to do this and you just, it wouldn't leave you alone. It was God compelling you. Did you obey or did you rebel? See, when God... Uh, you go back to, to King Saul. Um, Saul just continued to mess up, by the way. But there was one particular mess up that kind of was the straw that broke the camel's, the mule's back, so to speak. Um, and, and the nutshell is this. God sends Saul into Amalek. He said, I want you to fight the Amalekites, and I want you to destroy them all. I remember what they did to my people Israel. I want you just to wipe the Amalekites off the face of the earth. So Saul goes into battle, and as they get into battle, they decide to kind of pull against the reins a little bit, and they decided to spare the sheep. I mean, God wanted everything destroyed. He, God literally, by the end of the day, he wanted it to be as though Amalek never existed. No Amalek sheep, no Amalek children, no Amalek houses, no Amalek soldiers, no Amalek king. Everybody's gone. So they, but they spared some of the sheep, and they thought, well, these will make nice sacrifices for, to God. 
and they spared the king. Saul wanted a trophy. He spares the king of the Amalekites so that he can bring people by and say, look here, I defeated the Amalekites and here's the king. And he, was, he made it all about him, right? And God just takes offense to that. God takes offense when we make life all about us, amen? And so basically Samuel the prophet goes to Saul and he said, what have you done? Saul goes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. It's amazing, really, how we as humans can convince ourselves that we're walking in obedience when we're really not walking in obedience. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And Samuel says, well, I'm hearing an awful lot of sheep. Odd enough that the sheep is what gave it away. What is this bleeding of the sheep that I'm hearing? Where's all this, where'd all these sheep come from? Those are Amalek sheep. Why are they not dead? And Saul says, well, the people spared them. We thought we could sacrifice them to God. And this is what Samuel says to Saul. This is ultimately God's response. Think, you know, let this soak in if you don't hear anything else. He said, Sam, he said, Saul, you're missing the point. Obedience is better than sacrifice. He goes on to say that rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. You know, we can all go around bragging, whew, at least I don't, you know, do dungeons and dragons and deal with Ouija boards. I'm not into the occult, so I'm good. And God said, literally, I look at someone who rebels against me and my commandments the same as I look at someone in witchcraft. Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. I'm not near as interested in your sacrifice as I just am your obedience, right? To take what I'm compelling you to do and to be faithful to obey it and to do it. Do you find yourself rebelling against God's will or do you find yourself surrendering to it? Did God, and this is a big one, did God call you into a, a quiet time with him this week? I mean, did you feel the spirit of God at any point luring you maybe into the word? luring you into a time of prayer where you, you're just getting alone with God and, and, and seeking God's face, how easy was it for God to get you there? How easy was it for God to get you into a nice, quiet, alone time with him? Now, this one brings conviction to me too, so I, I, if you're under conviction at all, that's good, okay? Be because we go, we go and we go, we pull against the reins. I've got this to do. I've got these chores. I've got this job. We, we just pull and pull. And God says, I, I want to get you alone just for a, a time where I can speak. I can, I can pour into you. My spirit can deal with you. But I, I would venture to say that God finds it difficult at times to get us into that place. Because we fight sometimes like a mule. But a sheep wants to be as close to the shepherd as he can. Amen. Let, let, if nothing else, this morning from this message, if nothing else, let, let, the, let the desire of your heart be, and the prayer of your heart be, God, help me to long for your presence more. Teach me, Lord, what it is to be a sheep. Teach me how to trust you. Increase in me a greater desire to sit at your feet. Amen? When it comes to the work of God, we should find ourselves enlisting rather than resisting. Amen. I'm going to leave you with Isaiah chapter 30, verses 19 through 21. God, again, speaking to the nation of Israel. He said, for a people shall dwell in Zion. And again, ultimately, he's talking about God's people here. This is a representation of the church in our, in our day and hour. A people shall dwell in Zion. You might say a church in Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. What does the shepherd do whenever he hears a sheep ble bleeding out in fear or if, if there's a wolf getting after a sheep and it's in pain what does the shepherd do his, his ear is trained his ear is tuned in as soon as one of the sheep cry out he goes to the rescue and God said here's a promise that I as your creator make to you that if you will faithfully follow me when you cry when you hurt I will be there for you amen all and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction Yet your teacher will hide himself, any, will not hide himself anymore. But your eyes shall see your teacher. Your ears, this is the big one right here. Your ears shall hear word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right and you turn to the left. God said, the promise that I will make to you is my people. That if you'll listen, you will hear my voice saying, this is the way you should go. Walk this way. Don't walk that way. Do this. Don't do that. It's all about how 
much we're willing to actually hear and listen. Amen?